Okay, so the, the takeaway for you, at least, even if you have lost the details, is that if I did finite element method, I can convert this differential equation into another linear system. It's not the same linear system as the finite difference method. It's some other linear system, but I can write down the linear system, and you can think of this as a black box if you're in an application domain rather than working on solving these problems. So here is an example. I didn't do this for finite difference, but here is an example for solving this simple enough problem. I start with sine pi x. I derive the second, write the second derivatives, write down the f of x using this finite element method. Okay, and the both the computed and the analytical. The analytical solution. This is the true solution. I've plotted both the computed and analytical solutions, but you can't sort of see the. There's a little bit of blue. You can see it's. Even for such a simple mesh on zero one, which consists of like eleven points, it gives you the it sort of visually gives you a, a really good approximation of the true solution. And for some purposes, if you're interested in its derivative, this is the derivative. Um, the derivative does have a step behavior, something you might keep encountering if you do graphics processing. Sometimes you'll end up with these stepped reconstructions of surfaces and so on but so this 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 derivative of u also has this feature if you want to use the derivative for any purpose okay and then here is a 2d example of this okay so and here there is a few things that i have to talk about uh, so my 2d problem is this right hand side function uh, i have something which i can derive from this solution it's going to be something like some 4 pi square uh, no it's going to be some pi square times uh, sin pi x sin pi y or something like that okay you can write it down it's not important but if this is the true solution i can compute the laplacian and obtain a right hand side and use this uh, black box idea if you want of solving this problem okay and now i see the for the first time i see an advantage with this uh, finite element method okay so for from the 1d perspective it looked almost the same yeah i mean i had these uh, intervals whether i was doing finite difference or finite element and it's kind of the same thing but in 2d i see this difference i can now take the square i don't need to put down those uniform lattice grid points instead i have a mesh and i'm sure you have encountered enough about meshes already in the course so i don't have to explain meshes but the interesting point is i have to um, explain how the hat function generalizes okay let me see i don't have a i forgot to put a picture for it uh, but essentially if i looked at this particular one ring the hat functions generalization is that it's really going to be like a tent function it's like I have put a tent, erected a tent by putting nails at all these points, and I've taken this point to be uh, at value one. So I can, I would recommend um, you to please take a look at it by going to Math World or some or Wikipedia later. Um, yeah, this is my bad. I should have put a figure here. Okay, showing you what the tent function looks like. Okay, but it's going to be something like this if I looked at it in the in a projected view okay except now it's going to be defined not on these intervals but or on lattices but on these meshes and we and again this is equivalent or identical to saying these are the barycentric functions on these uh, triangle meshes okay so um, uh, i presume you know what meshes are and i've solved this problem on this mesh I can do integrals on each of these triangles, no problem. And I can set up that linear system matrix and the right-hand side corresponding to the F derived from it. And I, I have the solution here. Okay, so I've just plotted the solution. Ignore the title for the moment. It's not very relevant, but this function, at least I can visually check if it's correct. Okay, so this is sine pi x, sine pi y which means if x is 0 or y is 0, this function is 0. So for x equal to 0 or y equal to 0, indeed, uh, it the blue 
hopefully you can see the color. Uh, the blue color is zero. And for x equal to one, y equal to one, again, the boundary condition is zero. So indeed, this has the correct boundary conditions. Um, and it has it does have the correct behavior, like at half, half, it reaches its maximum value, which is one sine pi over two sine pi over two. Okay. So this part is like, you can think of it as a black box for two dimensional meshes. Sometimes you might deal with three dimensional versions of this problem in graphics as well, but in either case, feel free to use a graphics uh, library like libigl or whatever else, seagull or whatever your, your uh, either institute or your workplace requires you to use and you should be able to find the solution without worrying about the nitty gritty details, but knowing that you're doing doing a better job than finite differences. Okay, so I'm going to take a pause again to see if there are further thoughts, questions. Can you please go to the previous slide? Sure. This one? No, probably one to go more. Let me know when to stop. Yeah, this one, this one, yeah. Okay. From KU equal to B, we went to KU equal to MF. Yes. Okay. And that was how you divided that whole uh, uh, that whole space into VIs. V, from V of X into VI, VIs. That was the aim for that. Okay, so for for no ignore the VIs, okay? So um, it's needed, it, it's for all VIs and therefore it sort of is a dummy variable. But what, what I did here is that is this as like I explained? This leads to this problem, okay. And uh, this matrix essentially consists of elements which are uh, integral zero one, phi j i phi i phi j i prime phi i prime, okay. The right hand side vector b consists of elements which are like integral of f times phi i. And f is some compli could be complicated function. So here, what I've done is I've approximated f. I mean, we are doing approximations, so we can do we can do one more layer of approximation. What I've done is I've represented f in this basis. So even if f is a complicated function, I've written down its linear projection or projection into the space of linear polynomials, piecewise linear polynomials, to be precise. But yeah, I've, rep I've approximated my given original right hand side function by a function that is representable in this basis. And now these FKs are just the values of F at each of the grid points, which is like a number and comes out of this integral. And I now have an integral of the basis functions. This integral is called as the mass matrix. There are many approximations graphics people do for this mass matrix. So, but this is a this is the mass matrix in finite elements, which is why I now have m times f, where f is the vector of values at each of these grid points. Yes. Uh, okay. Now, when we go to the two D case. Yes. Yeah. So here, the how will the mass matrix look like? Great question. Um, some hint. There's a hint of it in the in a later slide. Uh, the okay for this purpose for now in finite elements, it's going to be a. It's going to be some. And uh, let me use the white code. So mass matrix in. Oh boy. 
Uh, okay, I got kicked out of the meeting in my pad. Let me quickly join again. Can you see your pad in the meeting, Kaushik? Can you? Yes. That is weird. I have lost it on my... <laughs> I don't see the whiteboard yeah. anymore on my <laughs> iPad. Okay. But that's okay. So let me share a new whiteboard. Mm -hmm. Create new. Okay. So mass matrix... Yeah, so if I could share some other document than a whiteboard, it'll be way better. Let me, sorry, folks, give me 30 more seconds. Uh, don't want this. Go back. No. Share photos box. Share screen. That's much better. Start. I'll do this. Okay, now I can do what I like. Okay, so this is what I prefer. Okay, so mass matrix for FEM in 2D. So that is the question. And maybe now I can highlight, show you what a what the basis function in 2D looks like as well, a, a figure I should have added to my slide, but basis function phi in 2D on a triangle mesh. Let me first show you that. And hopefully it will make something easier. So imagine this is a triangle in my triangle mesh. Okay, so this is VI, VG, VK, and my phi k, I'm going to draw phi k, is going to be value 1 and 0 here. Okay, so this is kind of, one needs to imagine that this triangle is lying in some x, y plane and the blue color value is height up above this plane. Okay, so the triangle is in the triangle is in an X is in the X Y plane, and this blue value is height above it. Okay, so this is this is the tent function for a vertex in a triangle. So I, I can write this down as is the same idea. Phi k on some other x j is value one if k equal to j, zero if k not equal to j. Or so there are three of these tent functions. This is a tent hat barycentric. You could call it. It has many names. It, it's polymorphic therefore. So this is the barycentric function at VK. And there, there would be one at v, VI and VJ as well. Which I'm not drawing but there will be ones for vi and vj as well so a given triangle therefore has three basis functions and these are the lowest order bases uh, remember in the course of my presentation i kind of said or convinced you folks hopefully that it's enough to consider these lower order ones for graphics processing so these are the lowest order ones a given triangle in a mesh has three lower order basis functions. Okay, that's what it looks like. Now I can take a slightly different view and I consider this ring of triangles. This central vertex is V. So these are, this is part of sometimes called as a one ring of triangle.
And I can now ask what does the basis function look like? It's hard to draw, but we can try nevertheless. It's value one on top of this and zero everywhere else. This is starting to sort of look like a dent if you if you stretch your imagination. Okay, this value is one. Therefore, this basis function I showed you above for the triangle is essentially the, the restriction of this basis function on a one ring of triangles to a given triangle. So I might call this, uh, this could be part of this. This is my triangle v vertex Vj and Vk. And okay, I did Vk there. Maybe I should have done Vk here too. So this is VI, VJ. So v, this triangle VI, VJ, VK is part of a one ring and the basis function looks like this tent around these one ring of triangles. This again is V, VK. Okay. Now what is the mass matrix? The mass matrix is essentially the same mass matrix in 2D. It's the same in any dimension, to be honest, as, a, as an expression. The mass matrix entries are going to be things of this form, Mij, where Mij is the integral. Now I have to integrate on the two-dimensional region, which, cons which is essentially the triangulation, the triangle mesh. And I'll have something like uh, phi i x y, if you want, phi j x y dx dy okay where omega is the region of the triangulation so the triangulation itself is part of some bigger region like that square that i showed you and uh, i have to integrate this this product of basis functions on the whole region but fortunately, these, these functions are compactly supported. VIs are compactly supported, which means outside this one ring, they are just zero. If, if this triangulation extends in the plane, I could have more triangles going along. But uh, but my blue basis function is just zero everywhere. It's zero identically outside this region. Okay, it's a zero value. Therefore, this integral slightly is, is simplified. It's going to be an integral on all the triangles incident on that vertex for any phi i, phi j. And then you, you can do some algebra and try and determine that if phi i and phi j will be uh, coincident or not, or partly coincident. And you can do a little bit of jugglery and figure this out that this will be an integral on only some finite number of triangles. So this Mij would therefore become summation over some E in the support volume. Uh, so I'm, I'm calling E as, okay, let me say it. E as the triangles in the support of uh, phi i union phi j which is fancy symbol for saying, okay, find all the triangles where phi, phi i and some other phi j are together non-zero and just integrate over those triangles. Okay. This is still this two-dimensional integral if you want. So this is the finite element mass matrix. And then there are approximations to it. But this is the true finite element mass matrix, which comes out of the integrals of these uh, barycentric functions or Lagrange basis functions or hat functions. Okay. And maybe for that completeness, I'll just write that uh, mass matrices can be approximated.
and you might think what can it be approximated by you could approximate it by a diagonal matrix instead of having a big mass matrix like this you could possibly consider doing that and people then would use some use these functions to be value one on some Voronoi regions inside the mesh and compute the mass matrix on that Voronoi reg region and so on and so forth. Or you could use the paricentric paricenters of the triangles and write down the write down an approximation for this integral. Again, it's coming, there's some references to all of this coming up in the slides, but the true blooded mass matrix is this this object okay. okay hopefully that answers the question to whoever was asking and we could move yes on. yes okay i'm going back to my slides Okay, so this is what we were talking about, and I, okay, so this is the stiffness matrix. This is the left hand side, which we did not discuss that much, but in one d we sort of wrote it down. It was derivatives, products of derivatives in two d if you're willing to buy that generalization, derivatives become gradients, and so this is. There is a dot missing. This should be, these are both vectors. So it's the dot product of these gradients that you integrate over the whole region. Okay, the region is also missing. Okay, so the finite difference method for this problem, not this problem, in 2D, where we had this grid, has a stencil that looks like this. Now by stencil, what we mean is, Essentially, some some of these quantities are going to repeat, and I don't want I can I can go back to it, but I'll let you look at it when when the slides are with you. But you you can kind of convince yourself this is the standard four like five point stencil where there's there's the north south east west point is what some some people would remark about the stencil. This is the standard stencil for the Laplacian in two D in using finite differences. These two matrices, we we saw sort of even looked at it in my handwritten part. These matrices, you have no hope that they are even related. Okay. Yet these can be with some some kind of uh, either you do finite elements on grids or you you extend the notion of finite elements to to triangle meshes things we are not doing in this today. But if you're willing to somehow go along with that argument for the moment, these two matrices, which do not look same at all, can be related. And in fact, they can be exactly the same. Okay. In fact, in one dimensions, which I did not write down, but if you did this as an exercise, you computed this matrix in one dimension, you will get back that two minus one, minus one, two minus one matrix. Okay, so that was the matrix we had. Okay, I will go back a couple of slides. So this was the matrix we have for finite difference. If you sat down and carefully computed the mass, the you don't have to carefully compute, you just need to compute it for two intervals and convince yourself that you'll get back this two minus one, minus one matrix. In one dimensions, the finite difference and finite elements matrices coincide. This was the two dimensional finite difference matrix, but I'm claiming something slightly different. I'm saying that if you're willing to do finite elements on grids or you extend the definition of finite difference somehow, you hope or believe that someone has done it already to, to triangle meshes, the stiffness matrix that you get, the left hand side system matrix, will be identical. This is some sort of a feature of the lowest order method. Um, it's not uh, something incredible. It's an interesting, you can, you can make arguments for this coincidence. 
but it's it's a feature in one dimension and two dimension. It's not true even in three D. Okay, there's no way to make the three dimensional finite difference and finite element matrices ever coincide. Even if you ex do this extended uh, finite element on grids or finite difference on three dimensional meshes. Okay. I so here I'm saying for the polynomial basis you can compute these these quantities analytically. Or you can just take the easier way out and throw it to a numerical integrator as well. You can, there are these things called as performing numerical integration on uh, simplices, on one dimensional regions, two dimensional cells, so on and like so forth. Uh, there was a 2010 paper that sort of does it very nicely and reasonably efficiently for. Uh, for any n-dimensional simplex, it's called U and Jimbota, X U and G I A M B O T T A. Again, if I'm happy to throw these references in to the slides itself when I give you the final version, I can send you an initial version first, but uh, I can sort of throw in some of these references into the slides it's themselves uh, if you care about it. There, there's a method that came out in 2010, which is like quote unquote now. Uh, at least widely used in the in the finite element community for computing integrals like this. But the graphics community doesn't have to really know about it because we are not going to do anything beyond the lowest order case in any case. Yeah. Okay, so in fact, graphics people popularize this. Um, that you compute the stiffness matrix, which consists of integrals. You can sit down and do some geometry. You write down these triangles, uh, uh, write down the gradient of this uh, function of the hat function that I showed you in my slide in my writing. Uh, just like this, this hat function has like a constant derivative. It's positive and negative the two dimensional hat function has a constant gradient okay so not too surprising because it's a linear function phi is a linear phi is a linear function so we can sit down and patiently write down all this for a given triangle and use high school geometry and notice some relationship between what we compute if i computed it generally not for for some general triangle by putting in, you know, X naught, Y naught, X one, Y two, X two, Y three as the coordinates maybe, or write down some uh, altitude heights and so on and so forth for, for the triangle. I can do some basic high school geometry and obtain this, this stiffness matrix via a geometric quantity. Okay, what do I mean by geometric quantity? Why are some areas, lengths of triangles, areas of a triangle, or length of some some uh, segments within the triangle? It could be the altitude, it could be some circumradius. So, there are so, some of these basic things that high school geometry tells us about on triangles. And then there are some angles, and in particular, it involves the cotangent of some angles. And Graphics folks tend to use this alternative yet equivalent version of right, computing the stiffness matrix. Okay. So you, and so this is a geometry, this only depends on the geometry. If I give you the mesh, I don't need to know what the, these integrals are or anything like that. I can write down the Laplacian's discretization, which is equivalent to the discretization by finite elements by just writing down this cotan matrix. Okay. And like I said, it's it's related to geometry. And the the triangle version, I don't know, I it's kind of lost in the annals, I think, but there's Poltier who uses it in late 1980s or early 1990s. Uh Pinkall and Poltier are these two people. Poltier is it is at is at the Free University of Germ uh, Berlin in Germany, I think. In 2D, it's been around for 20, 30 years, the Cotan ma matrix, although you could trace it back further as well, but at least I, I, I know the history of it at, from these 80s and 90s. But recently, Keenan Crane, uh, recently as in 
a few years with like two or three years ago kenan crane has a who's a who's a computational graphics person at carnegie mellon he has a version of the cotan formula involving so called dihedral angles for 3d and i at, at least to me it was new i was not aware of it before crane posted his preprint or version of it in which he also says you can compute it for any n dimensional mesh so you can compute the discrete discrete laplacian not just in 2d or 3d meshes in any n dimension which finite element people for instance know how to do using these integrals and so on but i think he claims to do it using this geometric expression for any dimensions therefore it's it's a useful thing it's a useful formula it's useful to know and we'll talk here is the formula we'll talk about it for a little bit now